imagining the fifth dimension. We keep returning to this idea. Every time we add a spatial dimension, we need to find a way to think about how the new dimension is at right angles to the ones that have come before. Another word for this concept is that each new dimension is orthogonal to the previous ones. Last entry we looked at how it makes the most sense to say that the fourth dimension is space-time, a dimension which enfolds length, width, depth and duration, and to accept that the fourth dimension is spatial. Yes, as creatures who get their energy from chemical processes that obey the thermodynamic laws of entropy, we appear to be moving in only one direction within that dimension, a direction which we call time. But the evidence is strong that the opposite direction, anti-time, is just as valid and just as real. And having two opposing directions is one of the basic attributes added by any additional spatial dimension. So what's at right angles to space-time? It's interesting to read this quote from a lecture by Stephen Hawking. One can think of ordinary real time as a horizontal line. On the left, one has the past, and on the right, the future. But there's another kind of time in the vertical direction. This is called imaginary time, because it is not the kind of time we normally experience. But in a sense, it is just as real as what we call real time. And it's interesting to think about this. One of the central ideas to this project's approach to visualizing the extra dimensions is Everett's many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, which explains how every possible outcome for our universe is equally real, but as observers we can only see one of those universes at a time. According to Everett's theory of the universal wave function, the reason we can't see any of the other universes is because they exist within a subspace which is orthogonal to the ones we are observing at any particular instant. But even though Hawking has talked about another kind of time which is at right angles to our space-time, and Everett has talked about the other parallel universes being orthogonal or at right angles to the version of the universe any one of us is observing right now, neither of them have said that these additional realms are in the fifth dimension. Why is that? Is this a failure of imagination from two of the most brilliant minds of the 20th century? Or is this a free will discussion? This is where my project's line branch fold concept for imagining dimensions becomes particularly useful. The fifth dimension, by virtue of being at right angles to all of the dimensions that have come before, gives us a way to get to those other connections of the quantum world and Everett's many worlds that might seem unimaginable from the viewpoint of someone who believes there's nothing more than 4D space-time. In 2007, a team of scientists at Oxford under the direction of David Deutsch published a new proof equating Everett's many worlds interpretation with the probabilistic outcomes at the quantum level and the parallel universes resulting from chance and choice, and New Scientist magazine declared this to be one of the top science news stories of the year. In 2010, a team of scientists at Oxford participated in a speculative art project created by John Ardern and Anab Jain as Superflux, the fifth dimensional camera project. David Deutsch acted as one of the consultants on this project too, but a particular note is a video they created featuring Dr. Simon Benjamin, who is from the Quantum Information Processing Interdisciplinary Research Collaboration, the QIPIRC, based at Oxford University. Within this video, you'll see Dr. Benjamin show a diagram very similar to the ones from my project of branching timelines resulting from chance and choice, and he suggests that these are occurring at the fifth dimension. Einstein, another of the great minds of the 20th century, accepted the existence of the fifth dimension. He did take a while to get used to the idea, but in 1923, he eventually gave his approval to Theodore Kaluza's proposal that the field equations for gravity and light are resolved for our space-time when they're calculated at the fifth dimension. The fifth dimension then becomes a way to combine Einstein's theory of general relativity with Maxwell's equations describing electromagnetism. A few years later, with Oscar Klein's additional input, the resulting Kaluza-Klein theory would eventually become the starting point for string theory. But if we're talking about something that is at right angles to space-time, why can't we see it? Well, we've already talked about our mythical 2D flatlanders, who would be unable to perceive up and down because it was outside of the length and width of their 2D world. And we've also discussed that although we've been taught that the world around us is 3D, 
The startling fact is that the time it takes for light to travel to our eye means it's impossible for us to see the third dimension by itself. So asking why we can't see the fifth dimension may be like asking why we can't see the other side of a building as we stand in the middle of a street. It's not that the back of the building isn't there, or that it's impossible to see, it's just that we can't see it from our current reference frame. But the standard explanation for why we can't see the fifth dimension and beyond is because it's compactified or curled up at the Planck length. Since we've already established that our 4D space-time is not continuous, but is divided into 3D frames, or quanta, I have proposed that it follows that our physical window into the fifth dimension is only one Planck frame wide, and the various aspects of our awareness can, as we saw in our opening quote from Winston Churchill, connect into the fifth dimension more fully. Make no mistake about it. With this project, I am insisting that we are really not in the third dimension, or even the fourth dimension. Our now is a moving point within a fifth dimensional probability space, and I believe the more that people embrace this idea, the deeper their understanding of our reality will become. The analogy often used in string theory is to think of the fifth dimension as being like a garden hose stretched out on the ground. From a distance, the hose looks like a line, but up close we can see that the walls of the hose are curled up on themselves, so that if an ant were to walk inside that hose, it could go from one end to the other, the straight line of the fourth dimension, but be moving in a second dimension as well as the first. In my Imagining the Tenth Dimension animation, I showed a Mobius strip and asked people to think about how a flatlander moving on this strip would feel like they were traveling in a straight line, but in reality they would be twisting and turning in the dimension above. This is useful as a way to think about the fifth dimension, but the garden hose analogy adds one further wrinkle. What if a fly were to enter our hose? Unlike the ant, the fly would be able to travel not just in a second dimension, but a third. So if our hose were 4D space-time, the ant would be moving in the fifth dimension, and the fly would be moving in the sixth. You and I, it appears, are ants rather than flies. But next entry we'll talk about how that's a good thing, as we move on to imagining the sixth dimension. Before we finish, though, I want to mention one final thing. I was thrilled to read recently that well-known physicists Leonard Susskind and Raphael Busso have published a proof equating the branching probabilistic outcomes of Everett's many worlds with the string theory multiverse. I'd like to give you a link to Sean Carroll's blog entry about the new proof, and also here's a link that was published at archive.org. And while we're looking at links, here's a Discovery Channel blog entry about a new theory analyzing black holes from the perspective of the compactified fifth dimension we've been talking about in today's entry. 